How many brought your Bibles this evening? Good. We're going to need them. We're going to read two passages from the Word of God this evening before we study Jehovah's Witnesses versus the Holy Trinity. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the third chapter of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, and I would like you to listen very carefully and follow me as we read a few passages from the Word of God. Exodus chapter 3. Of course, you're familiar with this passage. It is the great passage where Moses is summoned by God at the burning bush to return to Egypt and to lead the children of Israel to the mountain of God. Beginning at verse 11, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And the word I am here in the Hebrew, literally, aichyah, asher, aichyah, is a repetition of the verb to be. And the Jews themselves translate this, the eternal one. So actually, because God's name is unpronounceable, and because it transcends all human knowledge, they spoke of him as the one who always was, the one who is, and the one who always will be. Aisha. When you hear people arguing about the true name of God is Yahweh, and the true name of God is Jehovah, and the true name of God is this, and the true name of God is that, remember that nobody knows the true name of God. It is four consonants and no vowels. And since we don't have the vowels, nobody can pronounce the name, not even the Jews themselves. If you want to get as close as you possibly can to it, Asha is as close as you will ever get. I am. And this is his name. The Eternal. And this is what he tells Moses from the burning bush. Now that name was translated from Hebrew into Greek by a group of 70 scholars. And this particular translation was made approximately 125 years or so before the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. This translation, known as the Septuagint, or the translation of the 70 scholars, was used by our Lord and quoted by him quite frequently. So we know that it was known to him and to the apostles. Now with that thought in our mind, I want you to turn from Exodus chapter 3 to the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. John chapter 8 in your Bible to read the words of Jesus Christ. For these are tremendously important words and speak to us with great force concerning the identity of the Son of God. John chapter 8, the words of the Lord Jesus. In conflict with the Jews, Jesus said, verse 51 of chapter 8, Truly, truly, I say to you, if a man will keep my sayings, he will never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know you have a devil. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you are saying, If a man keeps my sayings, he will never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets who are dead? Whom do you make yourself? And Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say, He is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I do not know him, I would be a liar like you are. But I know him, and I keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw and was happy. Then said the Jews unto him, You're not yet fifty years old. You have seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, 
I tell you truly, before Abraham sprang to existence, the word is genocide, Abraham came to existence, I am. Now this is a direct quotation from that Greek translation of the Hebrew which I mentioned before. And Jesus reached into a common translation, just as common as our King James Bible, and said, Do you know who I really am? I will tell you. Before Abraham sprang to life, I am the eternal God, the one who spoke to Moses out of the bush. He even used the divine title and applied it to himself. Notice the instantaneous reaction, verse 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so he passed by. Why would that one phrase, I am, cause so much furor among the Jews? Well, if you turn the page to John chapter 10, you will find the answer. For here, Christ once again in conflict with his Jewish antagonists, answers them. I and my Father are one, verse 30. We are in union. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered the many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? Now notice verse 33. The Jews answered him, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. The understanding is very clear. They understood the language, they understood the culture, they understood the context, and they understood Jesus very clearly. Why do I take the time to begin reading the scripture and to explain this important thing? Because we will be discussing the doctrine which Jehovah's Witnesses attack most successfully and most consistently, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. And I want you to understand very clearly from the beginning, as we read our scripture, just exactly the identity of Jesus of Nazareth. So no one will have doubts about it. Now the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society came into existence under Charles K. Russell. And today it is the second largest of all non-Christian cults operating in the world. I spoke last evening in giving some statistics about their development and growth, and I pointed out at that particular time the enormous power of the Watchtower in terms of turning out literature, that their presses turn out more literature in six months than the combined forces of Christendom are able to turn out in one year, that they have more full and, time, full and part-time missionaries in the field than all of the Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox missionaries combined. I pointed out their tremendous coverage of literature and multiplicity of language distribution and their fantastic zeal, being able to canvas city after city, house after house, and to carry the gospel of the Watchtower throughout the world. But the Watchtower organization has definite theological views. And obviously, we're not going to be able to cover all of them this evening. Our main concern ought to be the centrality of the Christian faith. And that is the doctrine of God. If you are right in every area of your theology and you are wrong on the doctrine of God, you are wrong enough to lose your soul for all eternity. Therefore, we confine ourselves to this primary teaching. And it is of primary importance. What does the Watchtower have to say about the doctrine of the Holy Trinity? This, I think, is very important. Listen to them. Let them speak for themselves. Quote, The doctrine in brief is that there are three gods in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is not a person and is therefore not one of the gods of the Trinity. The Trinity doctrine was not conceived by Jesus or the early Christians. The obvious conclusion, therefore, is that Satan is the originator of the Trinity doctrine. Close quote. Now, I don't think you have to have any blackboard pictures or flannel graphs to get the message. If you can understand plain English, you understand what the Watchtower believes. The founder of the Watchtower said of the Trinity, quote, 
This view suited well the dark ages it helped to produce. Close quote. This theory is as unscriptural as it is unreasonable. If it were not for the fact that this Trinitarian nonsense was drilled into us from earliest infancy, and the fact that it is so soberly taught in theological seminaries by gray-haired professors, nobody would give it a moment's serious consideration. How the great adversary, Satan, ever succeeded in fostering the Trinity upon the Lord's people to bewilder and mystify them and render much of the word of God of none effect is a real mystery. Close quote. The Watchtower does not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, does not believe that Jesus Christ is true God, and it does not believe in the personality of the Holy Spirit. Our interest tonight is to discover what the Bible has to say about it. Now, after years of dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses on this subject, may I make this rather startling and, I hope, provocative statement. You cannot prove the doctrine of the Trinity to a Jehovah's Witness by rattling off a list of texts to him from the Old Testament or from the New Testament that are generally found in doctrinal books. You cannot convince him that there is a Trinity by quoting the Great Commission or by mentioning the fact that three persons, or apparently three persons, are mentioned in the same verse of the Bible. You will have no effect whatsoever upon watchtower people with this line of reasoning. But there is one line of reasoning that does affect them, that forces them to think and to probe and to study the Scripture. For they do recognize the Bible as the Word of God, infallible and inerrant. Therefore, they will listen to it even over the authority of the watchtower. There is the opportunity we have to communicate with Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I have found, and I pass this on to you for your edification, that the only way to quote, prove, close quote, Trinitarian theology is, first of all, to begin at the beginning, to assume absolutely nothing, and to start just as you would from scratch. And so, I believe we should begin at exactly that point. We should begin by defining our terms. What do we mean when we say the doctrine of the Holy Trinity? Jehovah's Witnesses mean three gods in one. What does the Christian Church mean? Well, very simply, the doctrine of the Trinity is the, and I believe that it's a very simple definition. Within the nature of the one God, there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these three share the same attributes. In effect, the three persons are the one God. All we are saying very simply is that within God's unity or nature, we can discern three distinct persons, so far as you and I are able to understand person. And these three persons are, in effect, the one God. That's the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. I admit that Trinitarian theology is difficult. I admit that you can't put it on a blackboard and spell it out to everybody's satisfaction. But neither is it unfathomable, nor can it be dismissed as beyond the mind of man. We can understand what God has revealed. The difficulty is that most Christians are unaware of what he has revealed. And we have to begin at the beginning to search and find out what that revelation is. Now, one of the cardinal rules of interpreting the Bible is this. You always interpret the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament, never the reverse. The New Testament completes the Old Testament. And you go backwards from the completion to the beginning to interpret. For the scriptures are complete in the New Testament revelation. Now, if we can demonstrate from the New Testament that there are really three persons, and if we can demonstrate that the three persons are all called God, and if we can demonstrate that there is only one God, then we are driven to only one possible conclusion. Things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. 
and the three persons are the one God. You don't have to be a great logician. You don't have to be a great theologian. You don't have to go to college. You don't even have to have graduated from high school to think that one through. Think about it for a moment. If you can show that there are three persons in the New Testament, and if you can show that these three persons are called God or Jehovah to accommodate the witnesses, and if we can show that there is only one God, then the three persons are the one God. And the argument ends at that point. You may say, that sounds very simple. Well, you'd be surprised how many difficult problems have simple solutions. For years, we have been hitting Jehovah's Witnesses over the head with standard textbook explanations of the Trinity, and they have bounced off the watchtower like BBs off the side of the rock of Gibraltar. I think it's about time that, as Dr. Barnhouse used to say, we got the hay down out of the loft and onto the floor of the barn where the cows could eat it. In other words, put things in terms that people will understand. So let us begin, just as if we were talking to a Jehovah's Witness, and say to him what I said. Look, if the New Testament, let's not argue the Old Testament, if the New Testament says that there are three persons, and if the New Testament says that these three persons are all called Jehovah, and if there's only one Jehovah, then the three persons are the one God, and the doctrine of the Trinity is true. Now, I have made that proposition to hundreds of Jehovah's Witnesses. I have gone over it painstakingly with them, sometimes stating it ten different ways in order to communicate it, and never have I failed once to have them assent to it as a valid proposition. They are willing because they are so sure that you can't prove it. Let us begin scientifically, inductively, simply, to see whether or not it can be proved. First of all, is there a person called the Father in the New Testament, and is he called God? A legitimate question to which we ought to have a legitimate answer. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 17. This should be marked in your Bibles. And I think it should be clearly indicated why you are marking it there. You are identifying someone. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 17. For he, the Lord Jesus, received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, we have proven two specific things from this text. One, there is a person called the Father, and he is identified as God. Verse 17, he received from God the Father. Identification. The Father is Jehovah. No possible way out. The Jehovah's Witnesses will agree with you right down the line. Secondly, there is a person called the Son. They will agree with that. Now the question is, is the Son identified as Jehovah? We have already shown, and that's why I deliberately began in Exodus chapter 3, to point out that Jesus Christ suffered from the hallucination that he was Jehovah. Or it was no hallucination. And he really was who he thought he was. You don't have any other way out of the dilemma. He took the divine name and applied it to himself. Exodus chapter 3, John chapter 8, John chapter 10. Either he was deluded, one. Two, he was hallucinating. Three, he was classically insane. Four, he deliberately deceived, or five, he really was who he said he was. Since the Jehovah's Witnesses will reject the first four, 
they are left with only one possible conclusion. He was who he said he was. And he used the divine name and applied it to himself. I tell you before Abraham was, I am the eternal God. And used it. Now you might mark those verses down in your Bible. There is a person called the Son, and he declares himself to be Jehovah. He even uses the divine name. I will never forget, in 1950, when Jehovah's Witnesses released their New World Translation. I noticed a copy on your uh, shelf in the pastor's study. They released the New World Translation of the Christian Greek Scriptures. And in it, they had translated the Bible and mangled it in such a way as to make the text that taught the Trinity and the deity of Christ read differently in English. And so I formulated a whole list of questions based upon the Greek and sent them to the watchtower by registered mail. I received a letter which I still have. And the letter says, all the answers to your questions are found in the appendix of the book. I went to the appendix of the book, and there's nothing in the appendix of the book that has anything remotely to do with the questions which I asked. So I addressed a second letter to them, and I suggested that they answer the questions point by point, and if they couldn't answer the questions, that they would give me the names of the Greek scholars who translated their Bible so that I might come in and talk with them and find out where they got their translation from. I was informed that the Watchtower Society does not identify any of its Greek scholars publicly for the sake of preserving humility. Thirdly, I challenged their Greek scholars to debate on national radio, coast to coast, on NBC, and offered them four hours of prime time to debate it, what their translation said and whether it was true. I did it on radio, and I did it on television, and I have crisscrossed the country for 20 years and made the same offer publicly from hundreds of pulpits and churches, seminaries, and even at watchtower conventions and in registered letters, to which I have never received replies. I therefore deduce that the Watchtower does not want to talk about its translation, and it does not want to talk about John chapter 8, verse 58, particularly because in the first edition they had a footnote which was terribly interesting. The footnote said, should be translated I have been, not I am, as in Exodus 3.14, a clear reference to who Jesus referred himself to be. And then they added this little grammatical, well, as yourselves, but him more than you, that this was due to the usage of the perfect indefinite tense of the Greek verb. It may come as some shock to you to find out that there is no perfect indefinite tense in the Greek language. It came as a shock to the watchtower because I wrote them a letter and informed them of that. And in the new printing of the book, that's missing. The perfect indefinite tense was invented to get away from John 8:58, and it was withdrawn when it was pointed out that they couldn't get away with it. But if you take the 1950 edition, you will see the lie at the bottom of the page. And if you look at the new edition, you will see the lie has been removed. But it lied for 15 years. Why? Because they are determined to deny that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. And it's essential for us to understand that we are dealing with people who are so dedicated to what they believe, so sincere and so honest in their conviction, that they believe implicitly what the Watchtower tells them. There is only one way to penetrate that shell, and that is with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and by prayer, and by showing the facts of the Bible as they really are. And you've got to begin, as I am doing right now, at the beginning. Now, there is more evidence that you can use, and I want to show you how this can be done. Not only did the Lord Jesus claim to be Jehovah, but the witnesses loved the book of Revelation. We have already established that there is one person called God the Father. And we have showed a second person who calls himself God. Let us see if there is additional evidence 
Now, I can give you 20 texts right now, but they're texts that the Watchtower has worked out answers for. The answers are no good. But I prefer to deal with the texts that they don't have answers for. They're better. And Revelation 1 is a very clear example. Verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses admit in their own translation that this is Jehovah God. And they translate it this way. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says Jehovah God, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. They have established the premise. Revelation 1.8, Alpha and Omega is Jehovah God. So mark that in your Bible. Right next to it, Alpha and Omega equals Jehovah God. That's according to the Watchtower. And I concur with them heartily. Now, as you are looking at that particular passage, I suggest that you go a little bit further to the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22. The person speaking says, Behold, I come quickly, verse 7. And as you go on reading Revelation 22, there's a repetition, verse 12. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I think that's pretty clear. The Alpha and the Omega is speaking again. And the Alpha and the Omega is, by Jehovah's Witnesses' own definition, Jehovah God. So Revelation 22, verse 13, can be cross-referenced with Revelation 1, verse 8. And you have a perfect identification of Jehovah God in both places. Nobody will argue. Now, as you keep reading, you will come to verse 16 of Revelation 22, and we find out who the Alpha and the Omega is. I, Jesus, have sent my angels to testify to you these things in all the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star. So Jesus Christ identifies himself personally as Alpha and Omega. And if there's even a smidgen of doubt left, verse 20 should clear it up. He which testifies to these things says, Surely I come quickly. He said the same thing in verse 7. He said the same thing in verse 12. And in Revelation 1, verse 8, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Now you have a full identification by the two words Alpha and Omega which are the Greek alphabet for Alpha first, Omega last. It's a very important series of texts, and you should mark them down. There's a passage I often use in the same book of Revelation, which the witnesses get quite upset about. You might add it to the ones I have just given you. Notice in Revelation 22 that the Alpha and the Omega describes himself, verse 13, as the first and the last. That's one of his titles. If you go back to Revelation chapter 1, John tells us something quite interesting. I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, verse 12, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. As you go down, you find a description taken from the book of Daniel, which the Jehovah's Witnesses concur is a description of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Now get to verse 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. So Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, identifies himself as Alpha and Omega, identifies himself as first and last, and now he even goes further. I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Literally, the Greek reads, I am he that lives and became dead. 
and behold, I live for all eternity. Amen. I have the keys of hell and of death. Now, the identification is irrefutable. Christ calls himself first and last, and Jehovah's Witnesses admit he's Alpha and Omega. It's a terrible problem for them to solve, and they don't solve it at all. You should know it very thoroughly. If you really want to have one more bit of information, I suggest that you mark down in your reference, along with Revelation 1, 17 and 18, Isaiah 44, verse 6. This the witnesses themselves quote quite frequently, and I think in this connection it will help you a great deal. It reads, and if you look at it in Isaiah, I think you'll see why. Thus says Jehovah, King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So Jehovah identifies himself as the first and the last. Now, either there are two firsts and two lasts, which is linguistic suicide and logical redundancy, and there are two alphas and two omegas, which is Greek suicide, or the same person is talking, and that you are forced to irrevocably. We have now shown that there are two persons, and they are both called Jehovah. You are not asked, and I am not asked to understand it. We are simply told it's true. And it is. But there is still more evidence that is needed. Is there a third person? And can such a person be identified? I think if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 5, you will see something tremendously interesting that many people do not see when they first read the book of Acts, and they have to read it very carefully to note these things. You're all familiar because I'm sure you've heard sermons on Ananias and Sapphira. They were the first five percenters. You've heard of ten percenters. They're people who tithe. Well, these were five percenters. That's five for me and five for the Lord. Well, Ananias and Sapphira and his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife, being literally in cahoots with him. The word privy means, in Old English, she was actually working with him in the deal. She knew what was going on. And they laid that part of it they intended to give at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Verse 3, and keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Now underline the next sentence. You have not lied unto men, but unto God. Now go back a verse. Peter said unto Ananias, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to who? The Holy Spirit. Now, who is this Holy Spirit? Verse 4. You have not lied to men, you have lied to God. The same man who identifies God the Father identifies God the Holy Spirit. You cannot lie to a table. You cannot lie to flowers. You cannot lie to a microphone. You cannot lie to a carpet. You cannot lie to a cat or a dog. You can only lie to a functioning, cognizant personality, because only a personality can be lied to. Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Peter recognized the Holy Spirit as a person, and then further went on to say, this person is God. Now, should there be any further doubt in the mind of the witnesses, and they don't like that passage, I would suggest that you show them Acts chapter 13, where there appears some fascinating reference to the Holy Spirit. 
Now, while they were in the church at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menahan, which had been brought up with Herod and the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Will you note that? Verse 2. The Holy Spirit addressed them. And the Holy Spirit is quoted directly. You do not quote directly impersonal beings because there is no such animal. You only quote personalities. Quote, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them, not the Father, not the Son, I have called them. Who is I? Look at your verse. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Uses the first person, ego, I designating personality. So there are three persons in the New Testament, and these three persons are all called God. And yet, 1 Timothy 2.5 says, there is one God. There is one God. You are driven to the inescapable conclusion that the three persons are the one God, whether you can rationally understand it or not. Oh, I recognize today that rational proof is everything in the scientific age, but in reality, there are all kinds of things which defy rational proof and which we accept. For instance, at the present moment, this audience is seated upon very comfortable chairs. Are you not? Anybody think they're not? Good. You're all wrong. You are all seated upon electrons, neutrons, and protons, revolving at a speed of approximately 186,000 miles per second. They have been arranged in mathematical proportion to simulate the structure which you think is there. But in reality, you are sitting upon energy in a form of matter known as seats. Do you comprehend that? Is that thoroughly rational to you? Don't feel badly. It isn't too rational to the scientists either. Do you know that there's a whole world called the world of antimatter that exists, theoretically? A whole universe opposed to our positive universe, which is a negative universe. Rational? Not in the least. Logical? Maybe. Is it demonstrably true? We don't really know. But it's a fairly good guess, argument, theory, hypothesis that it is. But you better believe that you're sitting on electrons, neutrons, and protons because the first atomic bomb that goes off will demonstrate it to you empirically because it is based upon the same premise. Exactly. Nobody understands it fully, or rationally, or logically, but they accept it. Nobody in this room understands what light is, whether it is corpuscular, whether it is in packages, or whether it is in waves. In fact, it may be a combination of all three, or none at all. But nobody is going to stop believing in the existence of light until they can rationally and logically explain it. It's here. Similarly, it is not necessarily a demand upon us that the mind understand the nature of the creator of the universe before it believes that he exists. He has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now you are in a position to start giving some texts, and the texts will have validity. 
I would suggest the following texts, and they are good texts. John chapter 20 reveals categorically the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, where Thomas refers to him in verse 28 as my Lord and my God. So he is worshipped as God. And the doctrine of the Trinity begins to emerge very clearly in the early pages of the New Testament. Once we have laid this foundation, look for yourselves. It's obvious, I believe, to everybody. At the Incarnation, Luke chapter 1, verse 35, Mary is told specifically by the angel, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee. The power of the Highest One shall overshadow thee, and that holy thing which is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Third person of the Trinity will overshadow you. Power of the Highest, first person of the Trinity, will come upon you, and what is born of you will be called Son of God, second person of the Trinity. Trinity at the Incarnation, Trinity at the Baptism of Jesus, Matthew chapter 3. And Jesus, verse 16, Matthew 3, when he was baptized, went up immediately out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Jesus, second person of the Trinity, is baptized. The Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove, third person of the Trinity, verse 17, and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, first person of the Trinity, in whom I am well pleased. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, at baptism. I believe it's possible to go on and demonstrate other instances in the Bible that prove categorically the doctrine of the Trinity. Matthew 28, 19, for instance, is the Great Commission, to go into all the world and baptize, making disciples, and then using the divine formula in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Again, Trinity in baptism. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have the doctrine of the Trinity most clearly taught. I don't know whether you've ever noticed this or not about the resurrection, but let me take a moment and point it out to you. In the resurrection, the scripture categorically says that the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Did you know that? It does. Acts 3, verse 26 says the Father raised the Son from the dead, and so does 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Both those passages say that God the Father raised his Son from the dead. You wouldn't want it any clearer than that, would you? But somehow or other it gets confusing. Because in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, Jesus Christ says that he's going to raise himself from the dead. In fact, his own prophecy is, you destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And John said he was speaking of the temple of his body. So the Father raised him from the dead and the Son raised himself from the dead. But the scripture says in Romans 8, 11, that the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. If the Spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he shall in like manner make your mortal bodies come to life. Now it's really confusing, isn't it? The Father raised the Son, the Son raised himself, and the Spirit raised him. All three persons raised the body of Jesus from the dead. And yet, in Acts 17, 31, we are told that God raised Christ from the dead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in resurrection. 
Your pastor gives a benediction quite regularly, I'm sure, in church. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with you all. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you want Trinitarian texts in the New Testament, in my book, Essential Christianity, I've listed about 20 of them, and we don't have time for them tonight. In the kingdom of the cults, another 20 or so. There are plenty of them. And the Old Testament is riddled with them. And they're all listed for you. The fact is that the New Testament teaches the doctrine. The fact is three persons are called God. The fact is there's only one God. And Jehovah's Witnesses have erred in teaching that the Trinity is derived from the devil. Oh, no. The Trinity is God. What is derived from the devil is its opposition. Those who would fight against God himself. On the front of every watchtower, there is a quotation from the Old Testament. Will you turn to it? Isaiah 43, 10. You might point this out to the watchtower. Because the watchtower says, and I want to quote them so there will be no doubt that the teaching is accurate, the watchtower says, Our Lord Jesus Christ is a God. Still the united voice of the scriptures must most emphatically assert that there is but one almighty God, the Father of all. The Logos, Christ himself, was the beginning of the creation of God. Our Redeemer existed as a spirit being before he was made flesh and dwelt among men. At that time, as well as subsequently, he was properly known as a God or as a mighty one. As chief of the angels and next to the Father, he was known as the archangel whose name Michael signifies the one who is like God. Close quote. Who is Jesus of Nazareth in Watchtower Theology? Jesus of Nazareth, before he came to earth, was an angel. The first and greatest angel made by God, Mikhail Akangalos. He who is like God, the first of the angels. But, and this is important, what does the scripture say that they put on the front cover of their watchtower? Well, it's worth reading. Isaiah 43, 10. You are my witnesses, says Jehovah, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know, pretty clear, believe me, pretty clear, understand, very clear, I am he. Before me there was no God form, neither shall there be after me. Close quote. So the united voice of Scripture does not say that our Lord Jesus Christ is a God because Jehovah says there wasn't one before him and there won't be one after him because he's the only one. Every great evangelist that I've ever read preaches from Isaiah 45. And they always preach from this text. You might write it down. Verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. There is no one else. I am God. There is no one else. The point that is so imperative for us to understand is the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses have two gods. They have Jehovah God, the big God, who created Jesus, or Michael, the little God. And so, they have more than one God. They have two. But a friend of mine who left the Watchtower organization and is now a minister of the gospel turned to me one day and said, You know, when I was a witness, and one of the 144,000... He said, a verse in the Bible used to puzzle the daylights out of me. And I said, well, whatever puzzled you, you were a top, a top watchtower person. I said, whatever puzzled you, I said, I want to know about what puzzled you. He said, well, he said it was a passage in the book of Hebrews. He said it kept needling the daylights out of me. And he said, every time I asked a watchtower for an answer, he says, they would run for cover. And I said, boy, that's got to be a good text. Where is it? 
He said, Hebrews chapter 1. I turn to it. Verse 6. And again, when God bringeth in the first begotten, obviously it's the Father, brings in the first begotten into the world, he said, this is the Father, let all the angels of God worship him. Let all the angels of God worship who? The first begotten one. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses say the first begotten one is Jesus. So when Jesus was brought into the world, the Father turned to the angels and said, Worship him. I said, well, why should that bother you as a Jehovah's Witness? He says, it bothers the dickens out of me because of Luke chapter 4, verse 8. And when you put Luke 4, verse 8 with Hebrews 1, 6, you can see why it bothers the watchtower. The devil said to Jesus, I'll give you everything, worship me. And Jesus answered him and said, Thou shalt worship only Jehovah thy God, and him alone shall you serve. How can God the Father tell the angels to worship Jesus of Nazareth when Jesus says, you shall worship only Jehovah God? It doesn't make a bit of sense. Unless, unless, verse 5 of Hebrews 1 is taken in the same context. For unto which of the angels did he say, At any time you are my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. And then he goes on with the passage. When he brought him into the world, he said, Let all the angels of God worship him. Now keep reading. And of the angels, he said, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire, but unto the Son. Notice the context. Unto the Son, he says, Thy throne, O Jehovah, is for eternity. The Father calls the Son God. When you put those passages together, it's devastating. I got that from a converted Jehovah's Witness. I give him credit for it. And it's a marvelous passage. I've never found a watchtower person yet that could stand up under it. Nor can anybody. Our time is up and we want to have a question and answer, period. I want to leave you with this thought. The doctrine of the Trinity isn't do dry. It isn't incomprehensible. It can be demonstrated many ways, analogically. And I'm going to give you the best illustration of it I ever heard. I was lecturing in Ohio on this very subject. And a professor of chemistry came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, I like what you said about the Trinity. The Trinity is not triplex. One plus one plus one equals one. But triune, one times one times one equals one. He said, I like that very much. He said, I have an illustration to go with that, which I think you should use when you lecture. And I thought I should too, so I took it from him and used it. He said, in a laboratory, he said, it is possible to have one substance, three things at the same time. I said, at the same second? He said, at the same microsecond. I said, what is it? He said, good old plain water. I said, how in the world would you do that? He said, here is how you do it. You take a vacuum tube and put in water pump out the air, and put the tube under 230 millimeters of gas pressure. Reduce the temperature to zero degrees, and as the thermometer hits zero, watch what happens in the tube. The bottom of the tube instantly freezes, the center of the tube remains liquid, and the top of the tube puffs into gas. He said, in that one tube at that given microsecond takes place what every chemist knows as the triple point of water. H2O is solid, liquid, gas simultaneously. He said, surely, if water, which is the simplest of all elements, can be three in one at the same moment, the creator of water and of the universe can be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same time. It's not going to give him any trouble at all. I leave you with the thought. 
we may not fully understand this side of heaven what the nature of God is, because in order to do that, I believe we would have to share that nature. But one thing we do know, there are three persons mentioned in Holy Scripture, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each one of them is called God. And yet the Scripture says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Can I tell you why Jehovah's Witnesses seek and state that uh, seek to prove and state that Jesus is not the Son of God? Uh, the answer that I can give to, that He's not the Son of God, not God, you mean? Yes. Uh, I can answer that very simply by saying that their theology about the Lord Jesus is derived from a theologian of the fourth century named Arius of Alexandria, who first denied that Jesus Christ was God. Uh, and taught that he was the second, uh, a second God, the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God. This was Arius of Alexandria. He derived this in the early centuries of the Christian church. This was picked up later on by Charles Russell in the 1870s, about 1871 or two, and he was the founder of the Watchtower Society and, and the uh, first editor of the Watchtower in 1879. So, uh, they did not come up with the idea originally. Arius came up with the idea, and they picked it up from him. So when you encounter a Jehovah's Witness, you are encountering one of the most brilliant theologians of the Christian church in its early centuries, Arius of Alexandria, and his heresy persisted for 300 years, and it took the best minds of the church, finally, to destroy it. And you're not talking to somebody who just happened to pick up something by the side of the road, they have distilled and refined the arguments of Arius from Pastor Russell, as he was called, and they really believe that, G that they have solved the doctrine of the Trinity. There is the Father, he created the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the invisible active force of Jehovah God, but he's not a person. And they think they've solved the Trinity problem, and they do it by attacking the deity of Jesus Christ. And they do it consistently all through their writings. And they have all the way from Russell and Rutherford through Nathan Knorr and the Watchtower Society today. Yes, sir. Two-part two question. What translation should we uh, be prepared to uh, deal with when we deal with the Jehovah's Witnesses? And what uh, deviations should we look out for in their theology particularly? Uh, their translations are the New World Translation of the Christian Greek Scriptures and the New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures are in, in green bindings published by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Secondly, they published the emphatic diaglot, which is not theirs, but uh, actually it's a translation by Benjamin Wilson, uh, who was a Christadelphian who lived in Geneva, New York, and Russell bought the plates from Wilson or his estate and took it over and printed it under the Watchtower's imprimatur for a number of years. That's a Greek interlinear translation, Greek on one line, English on another. They just came out with another translation, another Greek-English one from the Watchtower, which is very damaging to their own position. I should think they would have left it alone, because they correctly translate John 1.1 1, 1 in the Greek, which makes Jesus Christ God. And I don't know how in the world they're going to explain that one to their people, because they've been telling their people for years that John 1.1 1, 1 should be translated that the word was a God. And now they're stuck with this new one they just released, and it says, and God was the word. And I don't know how they're going to weasel out of this. I'm just intrigued with how they're going to uh, escape, and I, I don't know quite yet. But I, I would look out for that one, because doubtless some of the aberrations are in there. Those are their general translations. Now, so far as what you look out for... Jehovah's Witnesses deny the doctrine of the Trinity, the personality of the Holy Spirit, the deity of Jesus Christ. They deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They teach that he was raised as a spirit. They do not believe in the existence of hell or everlasting punishment. And until recently, they did not even believe in a resurrection for the unjust. They have revised their theology within the last few years and now include a resurrection for the lost, which they did not do before. Uh, the Witnesses... Uh, also teach that uh, no one may receive blood transfusion, 
because it's a violation of uh, Exodus chapter seven, uh, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 17, which says you shall not eat blood. Of course, you read uh, Leviticus 17, you'll find out it's talking about animal and bird blood. So uh, the witnesses are a little off on their exegesis. I call it a rather fractured exegesis, but they, they hold this view. They don't believe in saluting the American flag because it's the emblem of the sovereignty of the United States and is idolatry. That's what. Does that answer your question, sir? Sir? I... Why are they attracting so many people today? Why are Jehovah's Witnesses growing so rapidly? I believe there are a number of reasons. All of them are complex. They're not simple. Uh, I'll give you a few of them from my own observation. One, I believe absolutely, as the scripture teaches, that the powers of darkness, that Satan himself energizes the kingdom of the cults. And I believe anybody that's going to work in the kingdom of the cults is dealing directly with the prince of darkness. And I covet your prayers constantly because you are right in the middle of this darkness and how great a darkness it is. That's the first thing. Secondly, it has a great appeal because we have in our day a fantastic spiritual vacuum in the United States. Churches that are not preaching Jesus Christ's gospel. Clergymen who are denying the foundations of biblical theology from the highest pulpits in the land and from the greatest theological seminaries. People are justly confused by this type of uh, liberalism in our schools and in our churches. And so, sick and tired of liberalism and the gouging and the dilution of biblical theology, they are looking for some sort of spiritual reality. And I think they grab for the first thing that sounds halfway biblical. And Jehovah's Witnesses, whatever their faults may be, are biblical, 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 all the way down the line. Now, they may fracture the Bible in their hermeneutics, and they may twist texts and rest the scriptures to their own destruction, and I believe they do, but they certainly make great use of the Bible. And thirdly, Jehovah's Witnesses place a tremendous emphasis upon works. And you know as well as I do, anybody who knows anything about human nature, that we all love to think that we had something to do with it. And Jehovah's Witnesses have always been apocalyptic. Always talking about Armageddon is right around the corner. Well, you know something? For once they're right. It is right around the corner, and they don't know how close it is. And God help us not to sit back and say, well, they're going to get what's coming to them. That's not what we're supposed to be thinking. What we're supposed to be saying is, good heavens, think of all those people outside of Christ that we have yet to reach. These are souls for whom Jesus Christ died, and we haven't got a dozen missionaries in this field today amongst over 20 million cultists. Is it nothing to you all that are passing by that what? That people are perishing. These people are perishing. With Bibles in their hand, they're perishing. And uh, ours is the wondrous challenge of bringing them to Christ. You say, well, I don't know many Jehovah's Witnesses that get saved. Well, I know some. And I know Mormons and Christian scientists, and I meet people all over the world, not in this country, but all over the world, who have come to Christ out of the cult. And I want to tell you, you get a few of them in your church, and they're the best workers you will ever have. Because they've served the devil with great distinction, and they'll serve the Lord with even more distinction. They're utterly fearless. That's what we need. Christians who are fearless and who don't care what the Kiwanis, the Elks, the Oddfellows, the Masons, the Shriners, uh, the uh, Rotary, or anybody else thinks of them. The only person that they care about is what Jesus thinks. And when people start to think about what Jesus thinks of them and not what other people think of them, that's when they begin to go out and start winning souls to Christ. And until then, they're not going to do a great deal because they're frightened of what people will say and do. Well, don't be, because we're going to appear in the presence of God a lot quicker than any of you dream. And every one of us should give an account of himself personally. And there is a sin of omission as well as a sin of commission. Any other questions? And for the 144,000. I'm sorry, sir, I can't hear you. Oh, what is their argument when they get more than 144,000? Well, with that problem. 
And some of them keep dying off, I suppose, so I, I really don't know how they're going to actually deal with this, because according to the book of Revelation, there are 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and it names the tribes, and I don't see how you can get out of a literal interpretation of the passage. Now, the millennials will spiritualize it, but then, then again, they'll spiritualize anything at the drop of a hat. So we shouldn't be too concerned about that passage. Yes, question. Together, the two ideas of uh, Jesus Christ as man and as God, because the, the, that's what you're essentially saying, because it refers to God and the Father and to Christ. So how are we going to explain what appears to be an inconsistency? Uh, I believe the answer to this is found in the fact that the Bible teaches two very distinct things. It teaches that Jesus Christ was both God and man simultaneously. That's what the incarnation is all about. Now, he didn't have a button on the back that he pushed. One day he was deity, or one hour he was deity, and the next day he was humanity. He was at all times the God-man. That's the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of God and the Father and Christ. And Paul specifically calls it a sacred secret, something that God has not chosen to reveal. We can answer it, however, by pointing out this, that every time you see a passage in the New Testament which speaks of Christ praying to the Father, of Jesus saying in John 14, 28, My Father is greater than I. I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. These are the passages which you're referring to, along with Colossians chapter 1. Uh, many, many passages like that. I think what you have to do is read it in the light of one passage which explains it all, and that is Philippians chapter 2. Now, I'll give it to you literally from the Greek. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who existing in a form of God, did not think it something to be grasped after to be equal with deity, but emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a slave, and being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself even to the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bend and every tongue shall confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Son emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a slave. He lived among us as a perfect man. At the same time, he was God. He didn't know everything when he was here. He said so himself. He said he didn't know the day or the hour of his return. He said he committed all knowledge into the hands of the Father. He did not display omnipotence, omniscience, or omnipresence while he was on earth. Though he was truly God and existing in a form of God, these things he left in the hands of the Father. Yet his nature never changed. He was always deity. Now, I don't know how to tell you how he managed it, because the Bible doesn't say how he managed it. All it says is that he did it. And I'm willing to accept the fact that he did it. Now, if Jesus had ever said, my father is better than I, we'd be in real trouble. Because better is a comparison of terms relative to nature. But greater is a term which is descriptive of position. While he was on earth, the father was greater than he was because he occupied the position as a slave. But in the glory of the resurrection, Jesus said, all authority is surrendered to me in heaven and earth. He took back again in the resurrection what he had laid down in the incarnation. What happened in the fundamentalist modernist debates of the 1920s and 30s was this. The fundamentalists were so eager to make Jesus God in the historic Christian tradition that they ended up with all God and no man. And the modernists were so eager to make him all man and deny his deity that they ended up with all humanity and no divinity. Neither position is true and both are heretical. Jesus Christ is true God and true man. And no one can understand how God managed it. But John 1 says, in the beginning he was with God, he was God, he became flesh. This is sufficient for the faith of the church. In the rear, sir, Sunday evening, I made reference to the Jehovah's Witnesses saying that Jesus returned in 1914. The headquarters was in Brooklyn. 
Uh, actually, Russell taught that Christ's, Christ's invisible presence, as he called it, dated from 1874, and that in 1914 the millennial reign began, and uh, whether we know it or not, and the headquarters of Jehovah's Theocratic Organization was established in Brooklyn. I have yet to see the lion lay down with the lamb, however, unless the lamb is inside the lion. I therefore question seriously this millennial dawn theology. Uh, somebody else, you had a question. Jehovah's Witnesses believe in the rapture. Jehovah's Witnesses believe in the invisible second coming of Christ and that the rapture for them is known only to God's own people and the 144,000 are the bride of Christ who are permitted to take communion, the rest do not. This is a very peculiar view, but it is their view. And uh, they base it upon a study of the Greek word parousia, which is translated presence sometimes in the New Testament. They totally ignore many other words, such as epiphania, such as apocalypsus, erkomai, all of which speak of Christ actually being here. They, uh, they ignore any studies in this area, primarily because the average Jehovah's Witness couldn't tell you the Greek alphabet if it bit him tomorrow morning downtown. He doesn't know Alpha from Omega himself. He knows what the Watchtower has taught him. They are not Greek scholars. They are not Hebrew scholars. Don't be a bit afraid of them. They really don't know a thing about biblical theology. But I'll tell you what they do know. They know what they believe and they know why they believe it and they will twist you into a doctrinal pretzel unless you know the answers. A dear lady came to me in the church I was speaking in in New York some time ago and she said, I've developed a way for dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses and it's very effective. And I said, well, I'm <laughs> delighted to hear that. I've been dealing with them for some years and I've yet to find a way that's 100% effective. What is your way? She said, well, when I see them come up the walk with their briefcases, she said, I pull the shade down and lock the door and pretend I'm not home. We've degenerated into a nation of shade pullers and door lockers. It was a day when we'd pull the shades up and open the door and grab them by the arm and say, come on in, I want to tell you about Jesus. Something's wrong. And we better correct it pretty soon because the Lord's going to hold us accountable for it. Question. He poured himself out and took upon himself the form of a slave. This is what I intended to say. Well, I might have been, you know, I might have been quoting the King James there, found in fashion as a man. And I might have said found in form as a man. But uh, he was true man. I categorically stated that. He, di he didn't appear to be man. He was true man. But he was not omniscient when he was on earth. He was not omnipresent. And he was not omnipotent. He certainly did not exercise all of the characteristics of deity while amongst us. And uh, I would specifically say that all you need is one instance of absence of knowledge and you have disproved omniscience. And Christ did not know the day and the hour of his return. He specifically said so. Someone touched him in a crowd and he turned around and said, Who touched me? Not you touched me, but who? Now, quite obviously, if you read the New Testament, you'll find out that his supernatural power and his knowledge and everything which he had derived from his relationship to the Father. He said, I by myself can do nothing. It is the Father in me. He is doing the works. Now, I do not understand fully how this relationship worked, but one thing I'm positive of from a New Testament revelation, that the key to his living among us as a man involved some degree of his voluntarily laying aside the independent exercise of his attributes and living truly as a human being while at the same time never ceasing to be God. Don't ask me how he managed it. I don't know. Yet, 15 years ago, they told you that they were not born again. Now they begin to tell you that they are born again. Why have they changed their view? They've changed their view because they've redefined the term born again. That's simple. To them now, being born again means something different than it did 15 years ago. Now it refers to being a child of the kingdom. It has nothing whatsoever to do with being reborn by the Holy Spirit and being regenerated. Not a single thing. 
Yes, Jehovah's Witnesses, you quoted John 14, 9 to them, and uh, then they came back at you with John 1, no man uh, had uh, seen God at any time. Jesus said, he that had seen me had seen the Father, and they came back and said, well, no one has ever seen the Father. Isn't that right? That you're referring to? It's very simple. He's attempted to think of the Father as God. But the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. No one has ever seen God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit simultaneously. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known, has revealed God. After all, Abraham called the person that he spoke to on the plains of Mamre in Genesis 14, Jehovah God. He did. Now, who was it? <laughs> Certainly wasn't the Father. Because Jesus says you have never seen the Father's shape or form and never heard his voice. Who was it? It had to be the pre-incarnate Christ. So what the witnesses did is they foxed you into translating John 1.18, no one has ever seen the Father at any time, where it actually reads no one has ever seen God at any time. Nobody ever has Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but we have seen the Son, and he is the fullness of God in flesh, all that God can mean to man. Now, I would like very much to go on. It's 15 minutes past nine. I'm not dodging any questions. I'd be here all night answering your questions. I'm delighted to do so, and I'll be glad to talk to you afterwards if you have any further questions. But uh, we just simply don't have the time, and you've been a very patient audience. Tomorrow evening, we'll be discussing the maze of Mormonism. If you want to learn how many wives Jesus had, if you want to learn how you can become a god, if you want to learn how Mormonism has become as powerful as it is and what its plans are for the United States, its political power, its monetary resources, its political ambitions. If you want to learn what Mormon theology really is and not what Mormon missionaries represent it as, tomorrow evening you will enter the awesome world of the maze of Mormonism. And if you know some Mormon missionaries in the neighborhood, call them up on the telephone and invite them over. And we'll be delighted to have them here to ask as many questions as they want while we go together in the kingdom of the cults.